like to call upon Professor Dr. Kusum Sakya for chairing the session. I would like to request Dr. Uma Sankar Prasad to please proceed to the dais. Thank you, sir. I would like to call upon Dr. Baikunta Arial to please proceed to the dais. I would like to call upon Mr. Rameswar Khanal to proceed to the dais. I would like to call upon Mr. Chandra Gimiri to please proceed to the dais. Professor Dr. Kusum Sakya, I would like to call upon you to proceed to the dais for chairing the session. I would like to request Dr. Bishnu Raj Upriti to please proceed to the dais. Okay. Hello. Namaste. Good afternoon. Uh, this is a session we are going to have it on Nepal's post LDC graduation scenario and economic diplomacy perspective. So let's have a sit together and listen together. You welcome you all in this session. Thank you. Sage Professor Dr. Kusum Sakya. She is the Dean of Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences, Trivon University. She headed a Central Department of Economics, Trivon University, for more than two years. She was also associated to WTO, World Trade Organization, Nepal Rust Bank, contributed our excellence and applied efforts on UN Women, UNDP, UNFEA, Nepal Workers Society, and uh, many international uh, delegations she was part of and she has presented distinguished uh, papers 
and uh, uh, contributed uh, articles in the respected journals across uh, the region and the world. Madam, you may proceed because you are the chairing the session. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Matrika, uh, for my brief introduction. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. So we'll have a paper on Nepal's post LDC graduation scenario and economic diplomacy perspective. So we'll have a paper presenter by the Dr. Umar Shankar Prasad, who is here on my right side. And he's an honorable member of National Planning Commission. And he has a PhD and MPhil in economics. And he was also the chairperson of the Health Insurance Board, Government of Nepal, similarly the member of the high-level cross-sector advisory committee, province two, and he was also the associate professor of Central Department of Economics, Trivon University, as well as he delivered a lot of services and the policy-making advices to the government of Nepal. For example, the Nepal Service Commission, National Planning Commission, Nepal National Reconstruction Authority, the Ministry of Finance, so and so forth. And he used to contribute to lots of research articles in different international journals. And also, he's right now honorable member of National Planning Commission once again. So after his paper presentation, we will have a three comments from the three distinguished personalities. Here we have a Dr. Baikuntarial. He's just here on my left. He's economist by education, of course. Mr. Baikundarial has been serving for the government of Nepal since January 1990, since August 2021. He's serving as a secretary at the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology. Prior to this, he had served as a secretary of office of the Prime Minister and the Council Ministers, Minister of Commerce and Supplies, and Secretary of National Natural Resources and the Fiscal Commission. Working in this commission for nearly 20 months, he led the entry, entire process of devising formula for fiscal transfers to province and local levels. And Mr. Ariel has completed his PhD from Norwegian University of Life Science and Masters of Economics and a Masters of Public Administration from Tehran University and a Masters of Development and Resource Economics from Agriculture University of Norway. Similarly, we have a second commentator, Mr. Ramesar Khanal. So almost uh, 31 ex years experience in civil service. He's also right here on my left. Mr. Khanal sought a voluntary retirement from service of the Nepal government services to be active in teaching social service and work as a development missionary. At the time of his retirement, he was a finance secretary, a position which he held for nearly three years. He led a team to introduce reforms in the government accounting and reporting, public procurements, tax policy, and administrations. Mr. Khanal served as the chairman of the board in agriculture development and was a board director of in Nepal Rashtra Bank, Rashtra Banije Bank, Nepal Telecom Company, Nepal Airlines, and he was also the council member and executive committee member in the Institute of Chartered Accounts of Nepal for four years. Mr. Khanal led the Nepalese delegations in the number of the bilateral economic cooperation consultations with the foreign governments. He was alternate government of, for Nepal in the World Bank, ADB, and was a political focal point for Nepal in global environment facility. And Mr. Khanal has teaching experience as well, and he has a background of this MBA and commerce and SCMA from India. Of course, by his introduction, we are pretty much sure that his e area of interest are finance, accounting, and management control system. We are still looking for the one another com commentator, uh, Mr. Chandra Kumar Ghimire. 
Tandra Kumar Ghimire. Okay, so when after he, he arrive, I will give introduction to him. And here we have a special, I think the remarks will do by the Dr. Bishnara Supreti. Uh, everybody know him. He's the director, executive director of the, our Policy Research Institute. This is our team, so we'll talk on this paper. Definitely, I, I must be uh, aware about your time allocation as well. Uh, Dr. Uma Shankar Prasad will get the 15 minutes for your presentations, and other commentators will get 10 minutes each. So, Dr. Uma Shankar Prasad, this is the time for you to present your paper on Nepal's post LDC graduation scenario and economic diplomacy perspective. Thank you very much. Chair of this session. Excellency, Mr. Chaudhary, Ambassador of Bangladesh, commentators, ladies and gentlemen. This is a little difficult I have to see here. I don't know how to do this because we don't have a screen here, okay. So uh, this is very, I think, relevant topic in the current situation that we are going to talk on. And particularly for the selection of the topic, I must thank Institute of Foreign Affairs and Executive Director, Mr. Sreshtha. So we all know that uh, we are in the process of graduating from least developed country to a developing one. And once we talk about the situation of Nepal, then there, is, there are some specific characters. We are highly tied up with external economy. For some sense, we can say we are, for some extent, dependent on external economy. Whether we see in terms of foreign employment, ODA, or many other indicators, then our Nepal's economy is highly linked with external factors. Our domestic, unfortunately, the production capacity of the domestic economy is not so good in situation. So the topic is very, very important that after graduation, we will have to sound economic diplomacy. If not, and once I go through the study, then I found that one of the major causes of our underdevelopment of Nepal is highly linked with the not very effective and sound 
economic diplomacy. So, my conclusion in this paper is particularly focused on we need, we have to focus on effective and sound economic diplomacy. Unless we don't do that one, whether it is in terms of tourism, in terms of foreign employment, in terms of FDI, and whatever other components are there. Trade, it is very, very essential that the pers perspective has to be taken under consideration. And therefore, I feel this is a very strong and very good gathering that I see here that former diplomats are here, former secretaries are here, and I, I hope I believe some experts from Bangladesh are also here, I can see. So I think it is very, very important to shift our policy from domestic intervention to external diplomacy intervention and Institute of Foreign Affairs could be a good institution to bridge the gap. Just I, I put some uh, remarks on that and then I would like to uh, formally start my presentation. I think 15 minutes uh, will be a little bit less, therefore I request the organizer and particularly the chair to make some maybe 10 minutes extension for that one and I think uh, consideration will be there. So please first slide. So the paper is particularly divided into five parts. So, five chapters are there, and based on that five chapters, I have prepared five sections of the presentation. The first section will be uh, focusing the background and objective of this paper. Then, in the second part, I will be talking on the status of graduation criteria. Then, third part, potential implications and some country experiences. As we all know that only five countries are graduated after the concept was created in 1971, some five plus decades earlier. And based on uh, country experiences of these five countries, we might be able to get some learnings from these graduated countries. And finally, I will be talking on the, uh, some recommendations part. So please, next one. So we have currently 46 least developed countries around the globe. And we can see that most of the countries are 33 are from Africa, and only nine countries are from Asia. And once we talk from the South Asia, the number is very less. So we have been an LDC since it was the concept was created in 1971. And we are very much aware about the situation that in order to qualify the situation from underdeveloped to developing one, there are three major index, composite index that we have, and around 15 indicators are there. So if we cross the threshold of two indexes, then what we, that would qualify for the graduating. Uh, the, the second criteria is if the GNI is double, then what is required there 
for three consecutive reviews, then also it could be uh, the meeting point for the graduation. Now, Nepal has already met the threshold in three reviews, 15, 18, and 21. And it is in the case of two index. One is human asset index, and the second is economic and environmental vulnerability index. However, we have not crossed the GNI income. However, if you see the situation later on, I will be moving on that. In 2019, it was 1,230 our GNI per capita, and threshold is only uh, some uh, 1,222 dollars. But in 2020, little bit GNI per capita has been decreased in Nepal due to the COVID pandemic worldwide. So this criteria, even we have not fulfilled the criteria of GNI, we have, we are in the very near, and even in one year it was crossed. So once we talk about opportunities and threats, it is very natural that, that once even uh, in the lessons from five graduated countries, we see that the, in the most of the countries, they are in the condition to increase the foreign direct investment. So this is a very good situation for the developing countries after graduation that there would be significant increase in the foreign direct investment, which in the context of Nepal, we are very poor situation in terms of foreign direct investment. It is less than 1% of GDP currently. So this is very good hope for the after graduation. One opportunity is there. Second opportunity, sheer pride is there. The third opportunity that we see is the so negotiation capacity increases. Once we are in the better income and social indicators, our negotiation capacity will increase. This is very good thing. That once we talk about threats, but it is not once we see the data that would find, we find that this is not very relevant in the context of Nepal. We see that WTO and various commitments are there. Grants commitments are there. Various concessions are there. Various uh, support measures, differential treatments are there under WTO agreements and under various other agreements as developed nations are providing to the least developed countries. Unfortunately, if we see the context of Nepal, we, are, we have not been able to utilize the concessions and differential treatment significantly in the context of Nepal due to various regions, even it, if you see in the trade concerns or other aspects. So even for the five decades of underdevelopment, we were not able to utilize the various components provided by the developing, uh, develop, developed world in this scenario. So as I told, so what are the objectives? So sing, single objectives are, uh, is there. What is the impact on external part of the economy? So external part, once we talk, there are various components there. Trade is there, ODI is there, FDI, employment, foreign employment are there. So all these components are external part of the economy. So linked with the third party. And so one aspect is very critical in Nepal that after federalization of the country, our country is divided into seven provinces. But 
if you see the various indicators, three indicator, 15 indicators and three indexes, composite index, income, ATI and EVI, then spatial differences are very, very critical in Nepal. You can see in the income context, oh, oh. Come to the fourth, fourth slide. Okay. So this is the So if you see the situation, then clearly you can see here spatial differences. In terms of GNI, the threshold is $1,222. This is American dollar. And in the case of Bagmati, it is 14, 1400. But in case of others, it is very less. So there is high spatial differences. Similar situation can be seen in the Human Asset Index and EVI. So this is very, very important that we practiced for long time the unitary government system. And the, what was the critical situation that under unitary regime, we could, could not develop the country in a proper way. So there were various And looking at that situation, we adopted federal structure. And we all know that we have been practicing the federal structure only for four or five years. And within five years, this is very obvious that we cannot achieve very equitable development within short span of time. And our <laughs> okay, so I have to run very fast. Okay, thank you. So there are various uh, uh, differences here. And I must uh, tell you that if you see the social and economic indicators, then very, uh, very uh, critical situation, very significant output can be seen in Nepal from other various countries of the world, whether you see in the context of developed countries, developing and even least developed. What is the difference is our social achievement is not backed by the real sector. So our manufacturing sector is very weak. Our GDP growth is very weak, but our health and education the social indicator is very good significant improvements are there that you can see here. See, what is the situation about the very less uh, progress in the GNI, GNI per capita. If you see the manufacturing sector in GDP, then you see that it was around 90s, it was 9%. It became now 4 to 5%, around 4, 5.5%. So our manufacturing sector is very weak. On the same time, if you see the... What is it? What is it? What is it? Dr. Uma Shankar, sir. You have only the five minutes more, sir. No, no. Please, by Brown's here, no. So, if you see the social indicators, then you find that, you know, under five mortality rate, very decreasing. Similarly, prevalence of stunting, it is very significantly decreasing is there. Then mortality ratio is, has also come down. And it, it adult literacy is very increasing path and goes. So all the social indicators, whether you see the uh, uh, 
education or health index, it is very significantly improving in Nepal. On the same time, you, uh, we don't have very good progress on the real sector, GDP growth rate and GNI per capita income. So ne Nepal's economic diplomacy aspects, once we see, then we have around 30 embassies uh, outside of the country, then three permanent missions and other uh, things are there, and 173 countries we have bilateral relationship. So, in terms of export, so, we can see here that we have maybe 10 major countries in which we need very sound economic diplomacy. And these are in terms of export destination, source of import, foreign investors, tourism source, and bilateral de development partners providing ODA and destination for overseas employment. So maybe 10 countries are there. If we could manage a very sound and effective economic diplomacy in these countries, we might be able to strengthen our economy in a right way. And it is very good thing that in all these countries we have embassies. So the embassies could have very good work performance so that we can have good economic diplomacy for the proper uh, development of the country. The next one, please. So potential implications of LD Grayson. Next, please. So if you see here, then in the context of financing, remittance contributes 47 or around 48% of the total financing of Nepal. Similarly, revenue 38%. So our internal source of financing is only one third. Others financing are external and Nepal's trade deficit, if you see, la, next Garnus, Brahundi Janus Babula. So we have now 29% of GDP as a trade deficit, and it has been increasing in a very fast uh, uh, pace. Similarly, if, if we see the agricultural products uh, in the terms of trade deficit, it is also very huge amount of uh, trade deficit in agricultural products we have. And major export partners, we have very limited export partners. And we are particularly uh, with India and the, uh, in terms of, uh, in terms of products, we have also only 12 major uh, export products which contributes 56% of the total export in Nepal. So our trade diversification is very limited, even in terms of countries and goods and services. So we have to increase this one. If you see the official development ODA in terms of capital expenditure, this is very so. Our total government expenditure, one third is the capital expenditure. And out of total government expenditure, around 75% of the capital expenditure is externally financed. So this is very also, uh, we need to improve that one. So and in terms of loan, it is 70%. Out of total ODA, 70% is loan. Now this is very, this is very critical thing that we have to see, and this is highly linked that we can do better once we graduate from least developed country. And our now net inflow of FDI is only 0.5% of GDP in 2019. It was 0.7% in 2017. So it never exceeded 1%. So our FDI situation is very less in this context, and the government of Nepal is trying it the best to how to increase the FDI in Nepal. We have conducted many investment summits and uh, 
maybe uh, every year we are doing that one and from that we are trying to best our best and i think after graduation it will increase significantly looking at other various countries of the uh, 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 learning countries five countries of the world similarly country wise in, in flow of this is uh, something very limited countries and we have india and china uh, too much is coming there from there and post graduation country scenario just i want to skip that one but one learning that i must say that is we uh, in the most of the cases five country cases the uh, foreign direct investment has increased and it is very good scenario that we could do that one on that part so recommendation parts lord gomta recommend dan babu recommendation aun la la aba siddhi cha so recommendations we have to make legal reform is there also needed institutional reforms are needed human resource reform are needed financial reform reform resource utilization and programmatic reform so i have divided in uh, six uh, six uh, uh, major items and that are legal reform so recently we have done some Uh, agreements with our destination countries for foreign employment maybe one two country we have conducted so i think this is very important for nepal because our gdp around one third gdp is coming from uh, remittances and in this scenario very in, in formal type of uh, agreements are needed with these countries how to make our uh, uh, foreign employment safe and how we can send our skilled persons most of the uh, persons from nepal now the situation is unskilled labor is there and their uh, contribution is very less so how we can do it it, it is needed legal reform and i think uh, institute of foreign affairs maybe minister of foreign affairs uh, uh, could be a good avenue for that one and uh, we need to uh, that do that one and the institutional reform is i am very much surprised once i see the you know uh, the institutional structure of ministry of uh, foreign affairs that in no embassy they don't have any economic diplomacy department we are highly linked with the other economies but we don't have economic diplomacy department there so uh, even though not specialized men powers are there so how they are doing that one because they are just uh making some uh, formalities and economic development is not sound once there is no department there this is very obvious so what i say is there is the need of uh uh mofa we need to uh, at the all the embassies we need to establish the economic diplomacy department and i think for institute of foreign affairs this is very critical thing that we need to establish a maybe one sail or department whatever it is ifa should also have there and regular interaction regular uh, uh, things are there and human resource reform so some specialized type of human resources that uh, ministry of foreign affairs and different embassies we don't have so i have given the uh, recommendation to make uh, something like un survey and how what type of Uh, resources are needed at least one two three people uh, in each embassy that uh, and they can do focus on the economic diplomacy part so that could be very good and the financial reform i am very surprising that you know i don't know what is happening there institute of foreign affairs very little amount is uh, provided i don't know whether uh, the ministry of finance uh, ministry of uh, foreign affairs uh, is uh, demanding for allocation of budget to the institute of foreign affairs i request here if you anybody are from here from ministry of uh, foreign affairs please uh, demand the budget uh, increase the um, demand ministry of finance will look after that but you need to uh, increase the demand from there and uh, for institute of foreign affairs i also request him to do that so the the fifth part is resource utilization and i i believe utilization of our resources is not very at the optimum level and we should have a very 
optimization plan is there. How, if, even though we have very limited resources, we need to make it at an optimum level for this optimum level utilization plan should be there. And programmatic reforms. So these are very, uh, and for the uh, kind information, I must say that here in our upcoming uh, policy and program and budget, we are going to focus on that one, how we are going to attract FDI. So the concept of uh, health tourism has been raised and it is incorporated in the uh, policy and program that we are going to send to the uh, PM office and uh, president office on that part. So uh, health tourism will be taken as a good scenario and uh, Institute of Foreign, Foreign Affairs could be a part of that one. One thing that I must say, and the second part is our uh, uh, foreign reserve has been decreasing. So uh, what, what are you know, significant amount of money is going outside of country in terms of health treatment, health education, and education general. So we are going to restrict okay. from this budget. I don't, I'm not very clear on that part, but we are making the proposal for restriction. Those who are needed to go for foreign uh, treatment, only they will be sent there. And there will be a screening department here in Nepal, in one hospital, big hospital of Nepal. And once uh, uh, the person is recommended from that section that this person is needed to go for treatment for the yes. outside of the country, then only the foreign currency will be Masar, provided minute. to him. Only one and thank minute. you very much. Uh, sorry. <laughs> and with this, I would like sorry. to stop the, sorry that I uh, uh, my knocking you. Thank, thank you so much. much. Thank you so much. Let's have a big hand to the Dr. Omar uh, Sankar Prashad. Yes, we are very much aware that we are having the, on the occasion of this 50th anniversary of establishment of Nepal-Bangladesh diplomatic relation. Yes. We likely to request upon the His Excellency Mr. Salahuddin Noman Chaudhary, Ambassador of Bangladesh, to remark on his paper, sir. Please, sir. Distinguished Chair of the Session, Distinguished Communication Secretary of the Government of Nepal, Dr. Boykunt Ariel, distinguished guests on the podium, ladies and gentlemen, uh, namaste, salam, and good afternoon. At the outset, I would like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on LDC graduation, because Bangladesh is also graduating. So I thought that we should share our experiences, because um, uh, it is very critical that we should have policy coherence in our approaches when, when we, uh, we take it to the international platforms for, uh, in the post-graduation period. Uh, but also I should thank uh, Dr. Uma Prashad for the excellent presentation that you have made. Uh, this is a great uh, learning for me uh, because I take some interest on the LDC graduation issue and I think it could be a policy guidance for uh, uh, the policy in the policy level and also for the diplomats uh, because they are pursuing the economic diplomacy thing. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, upon graduation, uh, as I have mentioned in my earlier remarks also, we will not be having all the international support measures that we had been receiving uh, over the years. The market access privileges, the SNDT uh, that is the special and differential treatment provisions with respect to trade facilitation will also not be there. Thirdly, we will also not be eligible for the concessions of priority access to development financing. That is also very important uh, because we re receive concessional loans uh, from international organizations that will not be there also. So it will be a great challenge for us. Moreover, in the post-COVID world order, when the developed countries themselves are facing economic crisis, we may have uh, to see that the doors will close uh, before us before 2026, which is the la uh, landmark period. And in that scenario, 
we have to be extra careful in facing the challenges. Now let me come to the ground realities of Bangladesh. Currently, uh, we are the largest beneficiary of European Union's everything but arms scheme offered to the LDCs. The current utilization rate is 95% in the textile and garment sector. And projections under various scenarios indicate that withdrawal of EBA may cause 5 to 10% of loss of export for Bangladesh. That is very worrying for us. Secondly, Bangladesh is the highest user of trade-related international support measures like duty-free, quota-free access, preferential rules of origin requirements, uh, exemptions, um, export subsidies, etc. Our current utilization rate of this particular facility is 71%, which is far above the second highest utilization of 25%. And also, Bangladesh's success in the pharmaceutical industry recently is largely due to the effective utilization of TRIPS flexibilities. In addition to these erosions of preferences, we are also faced with the post-COVID challenge of muted growth across the globe. And if the current Ukraine situation continues, it will be a double jeopardy for all of us. Our export-oriented export industries will be severely affected. So to face these formidable challenges, we have taken up some measures internationally and domestically. In the international front, we are working closely with European Union on human rights and labor rights issues to continue enjoying the preferential market access under GSP or GSP plus schemes beyond 2029. We have been allowed uh, until 20, 2029, but we need beyond that period. We are also engaged with several countries to conclude FTAs and PTAs. We have very recently signed a PTA with Bhutan. Currently, we are negotiating with uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and Nepal. Uh, as Bangshidhar Sar mentioned in his speech also, and I also mentioned in, my, uh, in the inaugural session, uh, that we should expedite this matter of uh, signing the PTA with uh, Nepal, because uh, that will boost our trade, because that is one of the, one of the main, um, 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 main thrusts for regional cooperation. If we can increase our trade, we will be able to absorb the shocks uh, much uh, easily. Uh, we are now exploring new sources of getting loans also. And you will be um, uh, happy to know that uh, we have decided to join the new development bank recently. At the domestic level, uh, we have taken a number of measures. First is ease of doing business. We are simplifying the rules and regulations for establishing the industries in the country. Currently, we are having 20 economic zones across the country, which provide 25% of our exports. That process, the 25% of our exports. And we are, uh, we are in the process of building 75 more economic zones. We are trying to attract FDI uh, in our country, as just as in Nepal, our FDI is very uh, low. Uh, it's below 1%, which is not good. I mean, we should have more FDI, because FDI not only brings capital, it also brings technology, market access, and brand recognition, which is very important for uh, countries like ours to sustain uh, uh, the, uh, the growth of uh, uh, the exports uh, uh, in the next uh, world order. To fulfill the rules of origin criteria, we are encouraging backward and forward linkage industries. We have also given utmost priority to market diversification and product diversification. All our exports are concentrated in Europe and America. We are finding markets in Southeast Asia, Middle East, and Latin American countries. Uh, uh, and, and you know that our product is only garments. 
85% of the export is only garments, but we are trying to diversify this product also. Uh, promote other industries like furniture, pharmaceuticals, and other leather goods uh, uh, to be exported uh, in order to diversify the products. Skill development is another important thing because we know that in the next world order, we will not be able to uh, uh, compete with this cheap labor thing. We are branded as countries with cheap labor. We have to go for skilled labor, and also we need to increase the remittances for our economy. So these are the um, uh, uh, policies that we have taken. Another um, priority is the upgradation of infrastructure around the country. Uh, the, the recently, our investment in infrastructure with respect to GDP has risen from 2% to 6%. We have taken up a, a number of mega projects uh, uh, across the country, and uh, we think that if those are completed, it, they will hugely increase the business competitiveness of, of Bangladesh in the post-graduation period. And also, we are enhancing the internal resource mobilization by simplification of tax process as well as widening the tax base without increasing the tax. So these are some of the things that I uh, thought that I would share. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, LDC graduation is not a very easy thing. Um, only five countries have so far graduated from LDC criteria successfully. If we analyze their experience, we will see that sustainability is the main consideration. Otherwise, there is a risk of reversal which will be most dangerous for all of us. If in our case, the preference erosion is supposed to start in 2026, but we may face those challenges much earlier as the post-COVID world scenario, uh, in the post-COVID world scenario uh, would be more nationalistic and less accommodative. So a great deal of preparations are necessary, and I think that we should work unitedly in the future to face these challenges just as we did in the international forums in the past. I thank you for giving me this time. I'm sorry that I have overshoot my time, but thank you very much. I wish you uh, a very good afternoon, and, uh, and I wish that Nepal-Bangladesh friendship uh, uh, grows in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, His Excellency Mr. Salahuddin Noman Chaudhary, who has shared the knowledge regarding the policy to success the LDC graduations. Yes, this is what we have to learn from our neighbor countries like Bangladesh. Yes, uh, after we have got the very good idea sharing by His Excellency, uh, now the turn, I would like to request upon the, our commentator here, we have uh, Mr. Rameshwar Khanal, Bekutarial, and Dr. Bishnu Rasupreti. The first I would like to request upon the, the Mr. Rameshwar Khanal, sir. Sir, just a second, so we'll have a group photo once before um, His Excellency move from. That would be the nice for us to have a good memory, sir. Yes, have to get us, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable time, sir. 
So now I would like to request upon the Mr. Ramesir sir, uh, Ramesir Khanal, for the comments on the Dr. Uma Sankar's papers, sir. Okay. Uh, so you will have a 10 minutes, sir. Thank you. Thank Hopefully. you, sir. I'll try to stick by uh, time. Uh, distinguished panelists, honorable member of uh, National Planning Commission and the paper presenter, Excellency, distinguished participants. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I thank uh, uh, Institute of Foreign Affairs for organizing this uh, seminar on the role of economic diplomacy uh, post LDC graduation. Um, I would try to be very specific. Uh, I reviewed the paper prepared by Dr. Prashad. Uh, he has extensively examined the implications of LDC graduation. The conclusion he derives, uh, I, I, I fully, fully agree. Uh, the trade preference advantage that we uh, got by being LDC was not huge. Uh, it, it can't even be compared with any other country, uh, let alone Bangladesh. Bangladesh was the uh, huge recipient of uh, LDC trade uh, preference particularly EBA in European market. Our share of trade in European market is much less. And wherever we are selling, that is because of the bilateral agreements, mostly India and China, bilateral agreements, and US also bilateral agreement. Uh, similarly, the uh, benefit that Nepal is getting uh, in terms of the foreign aid uh, and concessional loan, uh, the amounts are sizable, but they are not by virtue of being uh, LDC. Uh, the support that we get from India and China are because of the uh, neighborly friendly countries and uh, the support we are getting from World Bank, ADB and other multilateral agencies are basically not be because of LDC. They have their own criteria. And so um, the aid component also is much uh, lower. But one implication which he has not uh, uh, probably uh, identified is that currently the concessional loan component in our uh, total aid portfolio and the concession part is nearly 52%. Normally, the definition of concessional loan is if there is 35% grant element, it is considered to be concessional loan. That component of concession probably may come down because uh, uh, in, in case of bilateral loan that we get from Korea and Japan, the rate of interest is very low. The highest interest we pay is the loan we borrow from China, 2%. Otherwise, uh, from other bilateral donors as well, the, and the uh, rate of interest is very low. So that concession might uh, slightly erode, uh, although that will not happen with the World Bank and ADB, but uh, uh, the loan that we are getting from the bilateral. And uh, the needs are there. We have huge infrastructure development needs. So to that extent, there might be some, some uh, effect on the uh, foreign aid, foreign assistance. Uh, the advantage we uh, were supposed to get because of trips, we uh, were never uh, able to use. And uh, because of that, uh, the losses uh, also are not uh, much there. So in terms of the, uh, uh, the recommendations that uh, Dr. Prashad is making, uh, I do not have objections on the programmatic intervention that he is proposing, the institutional reforms. But I would like to add a couple of issues. Uh, in the institutional part, uh, the agency for promoting economic diplomacy has been uh, overlooked in the past. We have been recklessly appointing uh, honorary consular generals uh, without any objective and purpose, what, what uh, delivery they are supposed to give to us. At the same time, we are also uh, without any uh, uh, guided policy accepting the foreign uh, consul generals, uh, some of them uh, take that position for a diplomatic privilege uh, of uh, riding a uh, very good car with uh, a blue plate. So uh, we need to re-examine uh, the role of uh, honorary consular generals, both uh, abroad and here, and try and see that we are uh, able to achieve uh, the diplomatic goals, economic diplomacy goals. They are basically for economic diplomacy because by name they are consultants. They are not just supposed to be, supposed to be giving visas. Uh, so that um, aspect uh, uh, needs to be looked into. I think the Ministry of Foreign Affairs will examine the role of uh, consultants in the in future. Secondly, uh, at least in the case of the foreign aid mobilization, there is institutional setup 
and uh, there is policy policy guidance. Ministry of Finance is the lead. So, uh, in in uh, aid mobilisation, we have uh, really been effective. And the last example we had was uh, during the earthquake. Uh, uh, the government was able to mobilise required aid uh, within a very short period of time because the institutions worked. Uh, that's not the same case with the investments and trade promotion. The collaboration, coordination, and the uh, institutional training uh, between and among different ministries, particularly Ministry of Commerce, Supplies, and Trade, uh, Industries, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ministry of Labor, and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, other different sectoral ministries like Ministry of Agriculture also has huge uh, uh, export. Uh, uh, footprint. They, they, they are the ones who produce the primary material. Where is the collaboration with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Uh, does the Ministry of Foreign Affairs ever communicate to Ministry of Foreign Affairs that in a particular country like Qatar or Saudi Arabia there is a demand for this kind of uh, uh, final product? Uh, there is no communication. The Foreign Affairs does not know whether the Saudi Arabia wants vegetable or fruits that Nepal has the, uh, the comparative advantage. So that part of the institutional reform is the major reform, which uh, Dr. Prasad uh, has been very conservative in highlighting that. I would like to highlight that. What we need to focus, I fully agree with uh, Dr. Prasad that we need to focus on the investment. Uh, if we want to, well, uh, that is, I would not speak on the entire LDC transition strategy because that is in the making. National Planning Commission is working on the LDC graduation and transition strategy. Just on the economic diplomacy part, the uh, the instruments that we should uh, have, conventionally the instruments are the bilateral agreements on investments, on double tax avoidance, on, uh, uh, on uh, overall economic uh, cooperation. Uh, we do not have any agreement with any country, bilateral or regional, on economic co cooperation. On investment promotion and protection, we have limited agreements. Uh, throughout past, we have been uh, very conservative in signing those agreements, thinking that uh, we suffer by signing those agreements. And I witnessed uh, one uh, terrible moment when signing that agreement with India, where uh, even the ruling party itself had uh, different opinions. Uh, and the Prime Minister had to uh, claim before public that I took a very bold step. In fact, I gambled by signing the agreement. So the Perception towards uh, uh, double tax avoidance agreement or bilateral investment promotion and protection agreement or BITs, whatever we call them, and uh, on the uh, agreement on economic cooperation. Without them, the economic diplomacy does not run. They are the instruments. Institu institutions itself don't uh, work. They, they also have to have the instruments. Economic diplomacy functions well only when the foreign investors, foreign uh, partners think that Nepal has the right framework for uh, investment, doing trade, uh, there is a confidence on those things. So that's where I think we uh, will have to pay attention to it. Uh, MOFA should take the lead in collaboration with the respective ministries in pushing the bilateral investment agreements and uh, bilateral uh, double tax avoidance agreements and bilateral economic cooperation if possible. Uh, although we are very conservative on the economic cooperation, we think that we always always lose. We go always with losing mentality. We should go with the winning mentality, and that attitude also has to change. The uh, next is, uh, unless we focus on two core things, the value chain uh, connection, the plugging into the value chain of South Asian market, we cannot think of going to global market immediately. For, for that reason, just now, uh, I think, uh, uh, Excellency uh, also highlighted the importance of the regional connectivity. Uh, energy, Nepal uh, can definitely uh, be a player uh, in um, from the supply side, or, well, sometimes also from the demand side. But if we have a regional energy market and a regional value chain, uh, so that we, we create a self-sufficient, uh, we have learned a huge story, huge uh, uh, lesson from the COVID-19 supply chain breakdown that had South Asia been having its own uh, supply chain, probably many of the pharmaceutical industries, critical industries, wouldn't have been uh, left alone because the supply chain from China uh, broke down. So the, uh, the focus of our economic diplomacy in the future should be uh, improving the value chain. Uh, if it is not possible with Afghanistan and Pakistan immediately, it is definitely possible with Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, and for uh, this quad. Uh, uh, quadrangle. So um, that's uh, where we should look at. In energy, 
think we are uh, becoming uh, slightly uh, uh, open, open-minded. In the past, we were always thinking that why should we be exporting energy uh, to make other countries rich? At least today, uh, if there is surplus, everyone thinks that surplus has to be sold uh, and then uh, revenue should be generated. So uh, India also has uh, uh, liberalized its market. It was also conservative in importing energy from Nepal. Uh, the attitude in South Asia seems to be um, brighter. So it is uh, getting brighter, at least in terms of the energy cooperation. And once we cooperate in energy, the other value chains will automatically uh, develop because the 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 partners, uh, the private partners, will know uh, that take the, take the pulse of each of the mem uh, country members, and the the collaboration can improve. So that's where I think we uh, need to uh, focus on. Uh, tourism, uh, Dr. Prashad has uh, abundantly highlighted, so I wouldn't focus much. It is also very important for us. We talked about Ramat, Ramayan circuit, Buddha circuit, and all those things. So, um, and uh, uh, for a country like Nepal, uh, if we want to gradually uh, reduce the remittance, dependence on remittance, and increase uh, the source of foreign exchange from other things, the tourism is definitely uh, uh, the, the area that we need to look into. So, I think uh, that is what I wanted to say. I uh, have not used my time fully, so I give my time to Dr. Upriti or Dr. Uh, Arel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for considering the time. And you have just one minute board left, sir. You can add that one. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you so much, Ramesh uh, Khanal, sir. So now I would like to request to appoint Dr. Baikunta Arel for the comments on the Dr. Umasanka's paper. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I repeat. Uh, thank you very much, the chair. Uh, distinguished panelists, uh, Honorable Dr. Omasankar Prasad, the member National Planning Commission, Your Excellency Ambassador of Bangladesh to Nepal, and distinguished participants over here. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to comment on the paper written by Dr. Prasad, he, where he has elaborately discussed about the present scenario as well as the implications, how we be how will we be addressing all the challenges and what should be the uh, strategies and all these things. The paper I reviewed was and found that it was quite good and good presentation of the data and it shows the status where are we and what are the uh, problems and what we should do. Uh, very much, I mean, the different opinion on this and things. But there are some interesting facts that I may highlight over here. A couple of things, I mean, the, when we aimed for LDC graduation, and that was talked some four, five years ago also, and people were a bit against of it, and everyone was thinking that we'll be having negative impacts of the LDC graduation in terms of trade, in terms of ODA in terms of investment and in terms of some other aspects which are related to the foreign countries and so. But what we see that in, the, in terms of trade, most LDC's benefits are trade related. But Nepal does not have that luxury. Probably we couldn't harness that luxury and that, that uh, benefits from, the, from our programs or from our policies or maybe, maybe from our own mindset and so. And always we blame about the landlocked nest of the country. Landlocking could be one of the reasons, but again, I mean, the uh, LDC benefits that are trade related, we couldn't harness it. And export orientation of Nepal is 9.6%, much lower than that of average of landlocked countries. Landlocked developing countries, that is 28.6%, and our is 9.6% only. However, Nepal shows some kind of promising prospects of structural ref reforms, and as Ramesh Sarsal also mentioned that, uh, the future is bright for the South Asia, and talking about the electricity and all those things are there. Let me come to that thing a bit later on. And on the investment side, for the investment, what we need, we need the FTIs. Although the number of FTIs has increased in the recent years, but actual realization is far less than the 
approved amount. That is the problem. Why we are not able to attract and realize all the, all the FDIs that is proposed is a question. And what kind of uh, policy environment, what kind of investment atmosphere that should be developed is on our own hand and we have to focus on that one too. And per industry domestic investment is larger than that of the FDI. So what we should focus on the larger FDI and larger industries and larger uh, production sector that is the key. So with the LDC graduation, some of the areas that we have to focus, maybe I just start with the uh, policy changes in trade. Being ascending country to the WTO, Nepal already committed to many policy changes. So we don't have many rooms left. Purushottam Sari is here, he also knows that one. No special policy room is left for LDC graduation. Example, the export subsidy cannot go higher. That is one one part. Export for non support for non agricultural products is less likely. And Nepal's most pharmaceuticals, which we have potential, not covered by patents. So there is some kind of problem. So that's why I mean, the, even, even with the LDC graduation, our trade would not be impacted much, unless we increase the production here. We increase the potential uh, goods and services over here. Investments investments are dependent on the policies legal frameworks, market potentials, and investment environment. Investment not directly dependent on LDC graduation, LDC category, but however, local value addition change may have some implications. That is the case with um, our regional trade and even, even with the international trade. And then the ODA, grants versus loans, we always talk about grants already being reduced even if we talk about uh, this year's, uh, this fiscal year's budget, grants is less than 20% that of the loans, total loans and so on. So that means, I mean, the, even, even the total, in the total composition, grants has very less uh, uh, share over here. And constitutional loans definitely will be affected, but uh, that is largely depends on the old bank's income category. What, what income category we are in and what income category other countries are in, that will be the major, major problem, a major uh, deciding factor for the concessional loans. Of course, it will be affected because uh, we are getting much lower, I mean, the concessional loans in a much lower interest rate, but again, that, that, that would somehow be affected. UN agencies' provisions may be affected, but the, I mean, the impact will be bit small that's uh, that also the data also shows that one and climate change funding nepal loses ldcf that is uh, least developed countries fund definitely we we'll lose that one but still we will be eligible for gf and gcf facilities so this kind of uh, things are there that's why i mean they there will be some some kind of impact but we should be able to devise the good policies and good programs and so so what uh, could be, I mean, the, uh, all, the, all the recommendations that uh, already Dr. Prasad has already mentioned and uh, uh, some uh, recommendations are added by um, Ramesh Sir, sir. Maybe, maybe I just add a kind of one or two recommendations, I mean the uh, addition in this. Uh, one uh, aspect I just uh, add to Dr. Prasad's recommendations about uh, strengthening the economic diplo diplomacy capacity within the, in the, in the country and as well as in the missions abroad. Uh, missions abroad. Uh, one thing IFA can do, I mean, the, it can organize a series of economic diplomacy training covering all, kind, all, all areas of the economic part, like the tourism, trade, and all these things. Not only the, I mean, the uh, basic uh, foreign affairs training only, but the economic diplomacy training is a must, and uh, the newly appointed ambassadors should also, I mean, they be, be trained in this, in this area. And there should be some kind, somehow the um, institutional linkage between Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other ministries which have uh, the economic role and which have the potential to get this, this kind of support from, from the countries outside Nepal and so. One thing is, I mean, the, we can enhance our service trade, but in the country, we have to improve the quality of services and outside the country, our missions and honorary consul or wherever should be advocating for that one and, uh, and engage with the, with the authorities over there. 
And one, another one is the engaging with trading partners for post-graduate, post-graduation and trade regime is very much needed. We might not be, I mean, the, having all, all kind of these facilities, but again, engaging more with them is a better, better uh, solution to that one. And increasing the neighborhood trade and regional trade is a must. As uh, Excellency Ambassador also told, I mean, the, we may think of having some kind of PTAs or some kind of other BIT, BIPA, and BIAs type of things with the countries which have uh, some some kind of positive impacts in in terms in favor of our ne Nepal's export trade and so, and one more aspect that I saw that the uh, Secretary of Ministry of Commerce also, and what I found that I mean our export competitiveness is a bit weak. So whether uh, how how we can uh, enhance the export competitiveness, it's it's one one another another aspect where we can just work on, and maybe some kind of uh, initiate, uh, initiating policy reforms to reduce the production cost is another part. Otherwise, our export would not be competitive. Like I mean, the, when we have the surplus energy these days, whether we can utilize this, them in a very efficient manner within the country so that our production cost would be less. So this kind of uh, place, this kind of policies and this kind of I mean the programmatic approach may be adopted and so. And maybe one thing for the trade again, attempting for the billion clubs of the export products rather than having very small. Uh, scattered type of export. Maybe we just consolidate our exporting commodities and maybe have a, have a kind of billionaire club of export products. Identify that one and then promote that one is the major thing. I suppose I didn't use my full time or if I overshoot, sorry for that one. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vaikuntu sir, once again for to saving your time. Uh, so it is almost okay. Thank you so much. Uh, so now the turn, I would like to request support of uh, Dr. Bishnuraj Pretty for the comments and suggestions. So special comments and remarks we are expecting from Dr. Pretty. Thank you. Thank mm, you. Session Chair Professor uh, Sakya, Presenter Dr. Shankar, Secretary, Former Secretary, Ambassador of Bangladesh, and all other dignitaries. On the behalf of Policy Research Institute, thank you for IFA for organizing this very exciting, very relevant um, uh, program. When I attend this type of the uh, discussion, I always see very nice, very powerful suggestions. Uh, me, as a non-economist, partially I understand what they are saying, but as a citizen, I know what I am facing. So in that respect, and since two years, I am also engaged from another way to understand Nepal government's policy, Nepal government, how they operate, how they do. So based on that, what I realize, maybe we will be spending few more years in the same way and at the end we will be nowhere. So that is real concern for me because almost two years ago also I heard that we need very clear strategic road map, how we want to do, what we want to do. We have to analyze all that. And always it comes with a small group of expert and economics and the concern is directly related with the entire population of Nepal. So how to bridge that uh, gap? One of the fundamental uh, issues I realize is to enhance that debate into wider national level debate and make the people political decision makers party um, political parties scholar practitioner all aware about these risk and opportunities with dr Sa uma shankar Shir and our very well known experts are expressing but uh, there is a very little uh, progress in that i am saying it's uh, very monolithic type of the knowledge we are uh, reproducing and reproducing and based on that 
maybe we will decide and then we will end where we will not be able to really achieve what we want to achieve. So my fundamental question for the government of Nepal is to little bit go beyond that type of the very narrow export focus debate and also include the wider uh, wider one for that what i uh, realize is the need of the public debate wider public debate and then because we every citizen have to face from this whether it will be benefit or whether it will be uh, difficulties for us and listening to the ambassador of the bangladesh how prepared they were um, while we are comparing that preparation Again, maybe I am wrong, but I am sure I am not fully wrong. Maybe a little bit uh, confusion, but we are not in that way, neither preparing nor ready to prepare. We have no clear roadmap, and there is a very strange type of the competition among the ministries or among the key actors, and lack of coordination, these all are really creating problem. Who will be ready to listen? Are there anyone to listen and address that? Uh, Police Research Institute, it is a government think tank. We are conducting the research. We have one small uh, study on this um, uh, startup business. And there were 35, 40 very young scholar returning from UK, USA, Thailand, and they were starting the business. What they faced? One man said 45,000 he has to pay for nothing just to get the approval. He, he was running here and there. He was literally crying there. Me as a person standing there, I was not able to do anything. And uh, there are almost all, there is a recorded documentation. If anyone wants to see, we can um, pass that. There is a recorded documentation of the cry of these young entrepreneurs who wanted to do something good. So in, in this type of the situation, we will not be really able to do and therefore all the concerned authorities who have the executive power and authority needs to rethink the existing way of operation if we want to get benefit from that. It is very clear from the um, uh, presentation of the ambassador of the Bangladesh, how prepared they are, what they are doing, and how, um, they are already negotiating for 35, uh, uh, on, until 35, beyond 2019. And here we are just discussing, that is not bad, it is good, we have to discuss, but it has to go beyond and also to have the very clear roadmap what we want to do next, by whom and how. Dr. Baikunt Harial said that interministerial coordination is absolutely needed because when we were going for one small issue in this ministry and that ministry and at that time we realized that it is so difficult. But who to do that? Everyone says it has to do, but the, the executive uh, authority has to do. So without this type of the um, uh, real commitment, always this sweeping statement may not work. That is how I see. Me as an observer, I have to observe what is happening here and what is happening in the reality. That is what I observe. So um, uh, first and foremost, we have to have the clear roadmap with the whole preparation and so many things we listen there in the recommendation. But these are the mere recommendation if they are not taken by someone and translated into action. And knowledge generation is totally ignored. And without uh, co-construction of knowledge, who will be sharing the difficulties and opportunity of the LDC graduation, how we can do that? In that sense, the re research should be given priority to do that. What will be the implication of all this, what Uma Shankarji has presented? So many recommendations. Very nice. Capacity building. Um, uh, economic diplomacy. All these nice uh, concepts, but Translation needs someone's uh, direct implementation responsibility. Who will do that? And until and unless, if these recommendations are not directly uh, uh, referred to that, this capacity building is the responsibility of this ministry, and by that time it will ha happen. Without that, how it will happen? 
so um, the issue is not the um, what we want to do but how and who the, the, until and unless we are not going little more critical way and debate these uh, issues this general sweeping statement will go the same way we are listening for so many times therefore my humble request to the executive authority ministries who they are have to uh, really prepare and start action collaborate there is a such a difficulty in the co collaboration for uh, getting one small approval it takes so many um, um, requirements and so many difficulties and we are talking about the promotion of the trade and export all that these all are concepts to translate that concept, we have to have the authority to implement. Just anyone can go and this, um, this office, um, company registrar office or something. These 50 to 35 people were um, making their all difficulties related to that organization, but that organization has not transformed yet. Even in single organization is hindering such a large number of young people who want to do something. And then, how it happens? Why not to reform that? Because uh, so uh, many uh, difficulties, I think if someone wants to do that, secretary, for example, of this um, respective ministry, should be able to do that. If I was there, I can definitely do that. If I am not able to do, I will live. So, uh, at least, please, action. Without action, it will not be possible. And uh, even after three years in the similar hall, we will be listening the same thing. Thank you very much. I am very direct. Th that is uh, what I am researcher. That is what I have to do as a researcher, as an observer. So, someone has to take the responsibility and to make it happen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Bishnara Supreti, who has the uh, experience of uh, policy research. That's what he's saying, whatever we are facing in Nepal. Yes, thank you very much for paper presenter and the commentators. Now I'd like to open the floor for the discussions. Yes, sir. Will you help someone here? Matrika? Will help to keep mic. Mic, yeah. Founder, President of Center for Diplomacy and Development. Thank you very much, IFA, for inviting me to attend this very important session. Actually, I have taken the floor to have some observations. Regarding, uh, because I'm a part of diplomacy and I worked for 31 years, my first observation is that I have carefully listened to the presentation by Dr. Omar Prasad. I the theoretical aspect are very good because you have presented a lot of statistics also. But according to this uh, title of the seminar today, what I came here to listen that what are our preparations for post-graduation? Like a Bangladesh ambassador has said, these are our domestic and international arrangements. And another aspect is that, of course, economic diplomacy was introduced in 1996. We were a part of that diplomacy. I work in Japan, France, UAE, and try to do even small steps. But it is so difficult in our country, in our embassies. No matter what is the difficulty, we don't have budget. And the small budgets we receive is received at the back end of the financial year. We can't do anything with this, this type of structure. So, and economic diplomacy, there are six objectives, as everybody knows. These are very important and very useful uh, uh, tools of economic diplomacy. But uh, why we are lagging behind since the last 26 years? This we have to find out. Mm -hmm. Okay, see? sir. Because uh, as a diplomat, I also wanted to do something good for the country. But as I said, it's so difficult. Lack of coordination lack of willingness, lack of cooperation, these all are hindering our, our uh, implementation of our economic diplomacy. So now I think after 2026 when we graduate, I think uh, Nepal also will lose many cozy areas, preferences, 
at that time, what we are going to do? These are the things we have to learn now. As uh, I said, Bangladesh ambassador said, at domestic front, we are doing this. At the international front, we are doing this. This is a, this type of thing we want to know in advance. And I think as uh, you are a member of, honorable member of the National Planning Commission, it's your duty to make effective changes in our rules and regulations because economic diplomacy is the most important and useful diplomacy for us. It's part of our foreign policy. Like in many countries, economic diplomacy, I, I, I offer you some idea about the France. They have also economic diplomacy, even they are so much developed. Foreign minister is the chairman of the committee. He oversees, supervises 180 foreign diplomatic missions by himself under his direct supervision. He get all the report. So where, when we can do such type of things in our country? And I think you have said about our honorary consuls, embassies. Honorary consuls, you know how they are appointed. They are useless. Maybe some people are good, but in my experience, during my four years in France, I have never seen the face of that, uh, our honorary consul. So how can we expect such uh, effective implementation of the economic diplomacy unless there are good people to implement it? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Monsieur. So, uh, I'm also a former foreign service officer of Nepal government. Uh, I'd like to make, I don't have a question, but I would like to just draw attention of a respected commerce secretary who had spoken a year, year ago, about a year ago. That means in order to you know, make effective economic diplomacy, seminar and discussion is not enough, is not, is not sufficient. He has said, unless the country have products and services to be exported, how you can do it? So first, we need to make environment. I hope if I'm wrong, our respected Ariel sir can correct me because he had spoken himself in one of the seminars and I had read it about it. So sir, perhaps you could give the response, what are the scenarios, what are the perspectives we are making and developing because you are the senior administrator of the ministry who is directly dealing with external trade and external trade matters occupies very much in the economic diplomacy. And in addition to other areas of uh, areas, identified for the economic diplomacy. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rambabu, sir. I've been an uh, international civil servant for the last 29 years and uh, have retired and come back to Nepal just uh, five years ago. And I belong to the organization, a forum of former international professionals of multilateral organization. It is a FIPMO Nepal, we call it. So we have members from different uh, international agencies, United Nations, um, like uh, system uh, members in this one. So far we have 77 known members in this forum right at the moment. And we have been trying to share our experience, uh, the knowledge we gain working in different parts of the world, uh, free of the cost for the development of the country and without having any affiliation to any political parties. Uh, what I wanted to say over here is, uh, this is a kind of the forum whereby Institute of Foreign Affairs have uh, give us a platform where we can discuss about uh, the economic diplomacy and the paper that we have been talking about right at the moment is very good. And the occasion is right, I believe, because we do have a 50th anniversary of the diplomatic relationship between uh, Bangladesh and Nepal. And sharing the experience from each country is very good. But uh, it might take a long time, of course, to have the discussions but the forum has been laid down, in my opinion, already here. And one thing is very clear. If the policy is not clear, and uh, how to achieve the goal, the step by step is not explained, and we miss the coordination there among the concerned ministries and the government counterparts, the achieving the goal would not be possible for sure. 
And in this case, particular case, of course, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs has a big role, and uh, uh, Institute of Foreign Affairs have been putting in the number of documents, uh, bringing all of us like together, a think tank, talk about issues and the thing. But mainstreaming of Ministry of Foreign Affairs together with other ministries is the most important things that we need to have. Otherwise, whatever we talk about without having the proper coordinations within the house itself, we cannot achieve what we would put forward as our goals. So I don't want to take much time over here. Of course, um, we'll be um, very happy in the future, uh, personally, to go to IFA together with my other colleagues. We can share our experience. We can tell that what is right and what is wrong. Uh, there are many areas to be talked about, I believe, in this respect. And I have a very, you know, much believe in the five areas that uh, the, the Secretary of uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, um, Mr. Varad um, um, Paudel has put in forward, and that's the way forward. That four, five areas, very important for us, and we need to discuss in these five areas, one by one, I believe. So that could be done in a different forum, even within the events of IFA, I believe. So hopefully there will be a possibility for that one. Thank you very much. Thank you. So anywhere? Yes. It's, yeah. uh, I am. Major General Purna Silva retired, PhD. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the Foreign Institute of Foreign Affairs for reviewing my book, Nepal's Instability Conundrum, Navigating Political, Military, and Diplomatic Landscape, which, is, which has appeared in this book. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I have a couple of comments uh, on economic diplomacy and some of the practical problems Nepal has been facing in the last couple of years. First of all, I have written a couple of articles on this. Nepal has uh, observed that you know, even our very small portion of our export, export on ginger, tea, coffee, uh, palm oil, they were stuck for uh, weeks or even months. Uh, on Nepal-India border. And currently, we have been seeing that thousands of our containers were stuck in Tibet. And our businessmen who are suffering a lot. The, another so, aspect is one of the uh, presenters today uh, spoke about the Foreign Development Investment, FDI, which is below 1% of our GDP. Whether our economic diplomacy has been focusing on this very practical and very very important aspect of our exports because i was when i was working in army headquarters you know some of the ambassadors of developed country they have visited army headquarters and they were press, they were giving pressure you know they were lobbying you know buy this item for your army you know buy this weapon buy this helicopter buy this I don't know whether our ambassadors who have been working in, in various countries have been pushing or lobbying with their counterparts in the relevant line ministries in the respective countries to promote our export exports. Can you say in the points uh, only, thank sir? You, th thank you. Uh, these, mm. these are my some of the you know yeah. uh, doubts, and I wanted to you know know why we are so uh, inefficient in pushing our national interest forward when it comes to our economic diplomacy or economic interest. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. This is the last question. Only, how many of you? Okay, only two, okay. Two hands are raising, so. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Abhishek Zaha. Uh, I'm a student of law and international relations. 
my question uh, it's more than question uh, it's it's an observation uh, i would say <coughs> on economic diplomacy and and uh, the context that we have uh, ldc graduation uh, we came to know uh, through the un resolution that nepal is to graduate in 2026 but this this is a very uh, eminent fact that i should be uh, knowing and along with me uh, students of the uh, institution they should be knowing this but i i'm very sad to say that uh, this fact has been hardly mentioned in our classroom. So once or twice we have mentioned that uh, Nepal is to graduate. Uh, just because we are in international relations classroom, we came um, to uh, discuss on this point, but I don't think other institution, other educational institution and inside the classroom, a student actually know that uh, Nepal is to graduate in 2026. So I think the most radical change has to be seen inside the classroom. It's the student who should be uh, uh, changing their pattern of study. We need to. Uh, change our pattern of study uh, to address uh, uh, how, how uh, uh, these four years of transition will be. So uh, to the concerned authorities okay. and uh, to the concerned institutions, mm -hmm. how far we have uh, conveyed this message to our students is, is a pertinent question. Thank you so much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. The, the last, very last question. Good afternoon. Uh, this is uh, Chitish Dahal uh, from South Asia, Wars and Trade, Economics and Environment. I have uh, two very simple and brief questions. Uh, the first one is, are there um, uh, clear examples of uh, countries which have uh, successfully uh, used economic diplomacy to uh, advance their development agenda? Uh, that could be um, a valuable a lesson for us to follow. And my uh, second question is, I think uh, uh, Dr. Prasad uh, mentioned in his presentation that uh, uh, the graduation from LDC status could have uh, positive implications in the form of uh, increased FDI. Uh, is there any cross-country empirical evidence for this observation? Or um, is it just based on a simple assumption that graduation could imply a favorable investment uh, uh, scenario in the country. Uh, in other words, uh, is the current uh, FTI administration regime of uh, our country uh, efficient enough to attract um, uh, uh, more, more FTI just by the virtue of LDC graduation? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. So the, all the questions which are related to the paper presenter and the commentators, hopefully they would like to answer you within very briefly. Thank you so much. Now, I'll, first I will uh, request to the Dr. Omar Sankar, sir. And will be addressed. First, I would like to commit the first thing. Uh, really, once we talk about attracting for FDI, so what are the major policies that we need to adopt, like double taxation and some agreements? These are the very crucial points. And how to reduce the production cost because production cost is also very important for country like Nepal that our competitiveness is going to be low. And value chain, connectivity, regional, these are very important things and we have been trying for that. Uh, once we talk about development, we all know this is a very long process and in context of Nepal, it is very well known that we have not done very good compared to some some East Asian countries or many other countries. But we cannot say that we have done nothing. If you see the 50 years back situation in Nepal, it was around 50% poverty. Mortality rate very high, education literacy was very low. Our living standard was very in critical situation. 
and that I have seen in my own age. Once I was in, in my school life, I used to see my village, I used to see various cities. Currently I am looking at that. So this is very clearly visible, that we can see that we have done a lot. However, in comparison to few countries, maybe Singapore, Thailand, something like that, we have not done good. If you compare with African countries, let, let us see and divide ourselves where we are. So hopes are lot, we are doing better, but we have to do best. This is on the track we are doing. And I think we should not be very pessimistic because the situation is not like pessimistic. Just thinking pessimism doesn't make any sense. We have to see the reality. We have to see the face of the people. We have to see the living standard of ours. Even though we have very drawbacks. So all these things are, uh, we need to see. We know that there are some lack of coordination. Some interministerial coordinations are lacking. Maybe our missions abroad are not at optimum level. But they are doing nothing, we cannot say like that. They are doing a lot. So, one of the issues that raised here is concessional loan, that it might be a risky factor for our, us. I, I agree with this, and even though the concessional loans we talk about, then it is not only linked with uh, LDC, because green revolve, green uh, climate change loans and other various loans, it is not linked with graduation scenario. So concessional loan is coming in two ways. One due to uh, LDC and some other parts due to, we are not uh, uh, linked with LDC. So I think we have to make this very good analysis on that part of how much we are going to lose due to our graduation. And it is a matter of, I, I need to that one. And BIT, BIPA, other things are also there. And regarding advocacy, I think uh, some advocacy is needed there. And uh, budget constraint, I have mentioned in the recommendation that financial reform should be there, human resources reform should be there. So all these recommendations are uh, connected with the budget, budget limitation. But what I see is the advocacy and the pushing matters as one of the army journals told here that pushing matters I don't think advocacy and pushing matters needs money. If an investor is going to some offices and making some gathering, maybe in a dinner party, and saying this is my, our product, you try to import in your country. I don't think this needs money, money, and a lot of money. Maybe a small amount of money is needed there. So how we are utilizing the resources? Our, one of the investors earlier from France, he told that we don't have budget. Yes, I, I agree with this, we have. But whether we are utilizing the available budget at optimum level, whether we are utilizing our efficiency at low optimum level, this is also a great matter for us. And this we have to think. So. I think all these uh, uh, suggestions are very valuable and I try to incorporate in the report and I stop with this. We have done a lot. We should not be pessimistic. Let us hope 
we are not going to reverse the situation after 2026. This is very certain. And with this hope, I would like to close my thanks. Thank you very much, Uma, sir. So now I'd like to request upon the commentator if they have anything to clarify the audience, sir. I think that Dr. Boy Kuntasar has something to clarify. OK, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, distinguished participants, for your presence and uh, questions and some comments. Uh, I don't have very specific question. Uh, at least one I do have that is from Ramabu Dakanji. Of course, I said, I mean, the unless and until you, you have the sellable goods and services, then you cannot enhance your trade. That was the thing. As it was in the presentation, as and as uh, Ramesh Rasal also mentioned that earlier in the some, some years ago, until some years ago, we wouldn't be talking about exporting electricity. Now we are talking about exporting electricity because we have it now. We have the surplus. And we are not only talking about exporting it to the neighboring countries, but also, I mean, the, to the regional market, like in the Bangladesh and so on. So you have that one. So well, we can, we can just enhance the product over here, goods and services, both, and then lowering the production cost, lowering the export cost, trade cost, and all these things, then we can enhance the trade. That was my point at that time, and today also I have the same point. Thank you. About the budget, probably. <laughs> A very short observation on the comment made by Mohanji. Uh, you, you talked about the budgetary constraints for implementing the ideas you had in France. But my experience says that the budget earmark for economic diplomacy was never used by the ministry effectively. And at the end of the year, we were asked to transfer that money for something else. Uh, that has been the uh, experience of Ministry of Finance, even my successor. <laughs> he also tells me the same thing that the, uh, the, therefore the capacity constraint at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs has been the major problem than the budgetary constraint. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for all of you. Let's have a big hand to the, uh, Dr. Uma Sankar uh, Sarma uh, for his. Uh, sorry, oh, <laughs> sorry, I was confused. Uma Sankar Prasad, who has given a very good paper for us, and then similarly we have got the comments from the three commentators. So let's have a big hand to all of them. So this is our, you know, part of our job also. This is a session definitely became a success. It was because of all of them. So, yes, last but not the least, I'm also trying to label my best to meet our time. According to schedule, still we have a behind. Uh, anyway, I will take only one, two minutes for the we conclude the session. Yes, of course, so this is a session we talk about all this economic diplomacy. So, whether we are the economists or none, but we have to have continue this economic diplomacy for the country. There is not possible to have a development without economic diplomacy. This is my very guaranteed point. So that's what I have really told. So as being I'm a student from the economics background, so that's what whatever the, our uh, Dr. Uma Sankar Prasad was keep and saying that we have to have the sound and effective economic diplomacy. So of course, we have to have it, but maybe IFA or some other link uh, ministries has to develop those kind of effective, you know, and the sound uh, tools for our economic diplomacy. Yes, we also definitely likely to success our LDC's graduations. So whatever the also the ex, you know experiences uh, was also uh, shown by our Dr. Sharma regarding the Boshana, Cape Verde, Maldives, Samoa, Equatorial Guinea, so and so forth. So we have to have also to get our per capita income more than the 2,500. It was also you know, targeted by our plan, but I don't know how, when and how we'll get it. Of course, it, without any development in our socioeconomic conditions, it would not be possible. However, the economic is the first and the last instrument to develop the country. So this is my conclusion as well. However, we should know about the economic diplomacy in this form, this uh, format, but forum, in, uh, that means we have to make a clear concept, we have to make a 
clear instrument we have to have the tools as well as the implementation whatever the is possible maybe by the bilateral maybe by the multilateral no one country in the world without economic diplomacy so this is the most important session which we uh, you know but to us in this session it was because of the 50th anniversary of establishment of nepal bangladesh relations so, diplomatic relations so and not only the 50th anniversary we all are expecting to have more than 50s our relationship with nepal and bangladeshi diplomatic relations so all the best for all of you thank you very much for giving me this chance to chair in this session so that's what i must thanks to Ministry of Foreign Affairs, IFA, as well as, as, well as the, our firm, uh, ambassador of this Bangladesh to Nepal, uh, Mr. Salahuddin Numan Chaudhary, and uh, also the ambassador uh, from Nepal to Bangladesh, Dr. Our uh, Bangsidhar Sir, as well as uh, our former ambassadors here. I have seen the, so many ministers, uh, secretaries, from the different ministers and uh, thank you so much for everyone who are here from the different you know um, agencies as being a part of this our session and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity sir thank you so much and uh, hopefully we will have a lot uh, what's key break i guess thank you thank you madam and uh, i would like to request everyone to please um, Proceed for the high tea there, just behind the hall.